afternoon. How are you all today? Good. good. Thank you. Um, we have a good friend of mine that's here. We we did. Uh, I've known him. Geez, I guess close to we were in 2007. Mm -hmm. We went through leadership together, uh, and he did the rope course really well. I was very jealous of him uh, doing that. But let me. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple things that are coming up for you guys. Uh, one is on this Saturday. We're doing Juneteenth. If you're a Jay Jeffries fan, he's going to be doing our story time. Um, and we have the uh, Jesse Norman School for the Arts who are going to be performing here. So if you want to drop by, everything is free. I know many of you are members, but it is a free event. Um, we're also showing something called Down by the River, Going Down to the River. Uh, it was done by Augusta Tomorrow. Uh, Mark Alberton was the videographer. And it basically tells the story of Springfield Village. And I don't think a lot of people know that story. I mean, I don't know if, if you've been to the park down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did a really nice job with the park, uh, but there was a whole community there and most people don't know about it. So if you want to learn some more, please, it's about a 20 minute film. That's also going on on Saturday. Um, we are doing uh, the Great Building Showdown again this year, uh, the Lego event. Um, and we're expanding it a little bit. We're going, um, I actually know the guy who is the Guinness World Record holder on Star Wars Legos. He's got the world's largest collection and I swear to you he does. I've been out to his house. Legos are everywhere. Uh, but he, we're gonna be putting some of his stuff on display, including the Death Star. Do we have any Star Wars fans here? Yeah, yeah. Sure. But the Death Star, he's got that. But it's not the Death Star. He supersizes them. So they're going to they're be on view in the rotunda. Uh, and then after that, we are doing Night at the Museum again this year. It's going to be in August. Uh, the, the Lego event is, and I can't use that term. You'll never see me use it because you have to pay for it. It's a copyright thing. Um, but it is uh, June 29th through July 9th. It is a free event, so you can come in and build your own, or you can come in and see what other people have built. Uh, the Night at the Museum is on August 10th, uh, and it's a Thursday evening. Uh, it is a fundraiser for us, but we are putting a lineup together that's going to blow people away. So be looking at that. It is a fundraiser, and it's $100 a ticket that you get. Great tour. Ten, ten people will be around the museum, first and second floor. And there'll be some heavy hors d'oeuvres and a little libation uh, for those that like that. Uh, so put that on your calendar as well. And I do have one person I'd like to introduce you all to. As much as I love doing this to, for you guys, um, I, I prefer my education manager doing it. And we have a new one. And Crystal Lyons is joining the museum staff. Hi. So if you get a chance, welcome her. There you go. Hi. Uh, so she'll be taking over this job, but I will be attending. I'll, I'll be doing that. Uh, now to our speaker today. Uh, Randy and I go back to, we did Leadership Augusta back in 2007. Uh, he has been doing this as probably as long, I've been a museum professional now for well over 30 years. He's been doing it for over 30 years, doing his sports thing. Uh, I first knew about him, uh, the tour to Georgia. You remember the bicycle race that was going on? Mm -hmm. He's the guy, and I was very impressed with that because I because I it was one of the first big events that I participated in as a museum director. I went down to what, what's the guy's name downtown, the bike place, Andy Jordan. Andy Jordan, uh, and I said, "Can I borrow one of your racing bikes?" And he not only gave me a racing bike, but he had one that he had actually used in Tour de Georgia, and I put it on view. Uh, so it was my introduction to the sports world here. Um, since then, geez, he's been, uh, he, he was out in Columbia County. He ran the, the program out there. And now you're in North, North Augusta. He is now the executive director of the whole shebang for North Augusta. So if you hear about the Peach, Peach Jam, Peach Jam uh, he still does the bicycle stuff. Uh, he's still, you're still racing? A little bit, yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, we go back a ways. Uh, he is, uh, you're gonna hear his enthusiasm. And there's one thing I'm not going to talk about that really surprised me when I got to know him a little bit more. His involvement in uh, something that happened in 19... When was the Olympics? 96. 96. Yeah. So you'll hear about that too. Please welcome. 
Ready to join. Hello there. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate you having me. And uh, microphones freak me out a little bit. So That's if y'all can hear me okay, mm -hmm. we're not going to use the microphone. And I'm going to digress a moment. You'll, you'll find that I do that a lot. But um, when I first started doing cycling events in Augusta, um, I was invited to speak at a press conference. I've never done anything like that. I've never spoken before a camera and the media. And um, I was watching everybody else do their notes. We were over at the boathouse. And... Um, I was just watching everybody else do their, their, their thing, and I was like, you know, I've got this. And I had this, this perfectly written you know, script, and I was just going to stick to it, and this is going to be great. And I said, I don't need this. I've got this. I know this. And so I turned to somebody, and I said, here's my notes. And I walked up to the podium, and not thinking that, like, A, you're amplified, and if you're amplified and there's speakers over your head, you're going to hear the amplification. You're not going to hear your voice as it just exists in a regular room. And so I started talking, and as soon as I started talking, everything went out of my brain. <laughs> I just sat there and I looked for a little bit, and then I was just like, I sort of faked it. And are you sensing a pattern? Because I told you a similar story <laughs> earlier. So, um, and also I'll just say this too before I really get into the meat of this, but um, I did get a C in public speaking, so I, I hope that this is more than average. You know, I really do. <laughs> Um, but if it's not, I'm sorry. <laughs> but hopefully the knowledge that I share with you will, will be okay. Um, but um, you know, to kind of go back a little bit about myself, um, right now I am working with the city of North Augusta. I was hired a year and a half ago, and um, technically my, my, um, my title is Marketing and Tourism Coordinator, you know, but I'm often referred to as the director because I guess in a way that's what I am. Um, but I've been there for about a year and a half, and um, what I've been doing in that time is basically building a tourism program for the community. So this involved um, developing a new logo for Visit North Augusta, which is going to be our tourism brand. Um, we developed a new website. Um, we're in the process right now of going through a digital campaign to advertise outside of the area. And then um, I'm also doing a lot of event development. Um, you may or may not have heard, we did an event last weekend called Down to the River Festival. And uh, this was an initiative that was started by the mayor last year. It was called Rockin' and Raffin. And, um, you know, it was, it was nice. It was a good first attempt, but it's like, okay, now that we've done this, let's expand it and treat it like it's going to be something big and long lasting. And so we, uh, re we rebranded it down to the River Festival and uh, turned it into a multi-sport festival that had paddling, running, um, some bicycling events, um, a live concert, uh, with an artist that brought in around a thousand people to our amphitheater. And so anyway, that's what I've been doing for about the last year and a half. Um, prior to that, I was, I was and I still am the Vice President of Community Development for Sports Strategies. Um, this is a Birmingham-based sports consulting group, and uh, we work with communities across the country to help them understand how they can maximize their assets um, for the purpose of sports tourism. And so that might mean they have a great athletic field set up. Um, they might have mountain bike trails. They might have anything that could be utilized as a sports venue. And so when I go into these communities, I talk to the local stakeholders, that could be city leadership, um, you know, whomever. And I take a look at their facilities and then we write plans for them to help them understand how they can turn sports tourism into economic development. Prior to that, I was the executive director of Columbia County's um, Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I restarted that organization, and I was there for four years. And prior to that, I was with the Augusta Sports Council. And um, so that's a little bit about my background. Now, why all of this sort of matters, and what I hope that y'all are able to take away from this presentation, one is that sports tourism is economic development. And, um, so when you go into a restaurant on a Friday evening or a Saturday afternoon, you see a bunch of little kids wearing baseball uniforms or you know, cheerleader outfits, um, that could be the local team or it could be a team that has been brought in from out of town um, to basically come in to play in a sports tournament. And when these people come in for these tournaments, they stay in your hotels, they buy store stuff in your stores, and they also um, make purchases in your restaurants. And uh, the money that they leave behind you know, goes into a general fund because the tax revenue um, that pays for stormwater drains and police cars. But then a lot of times too, like when you stay in a community, if you stay in a hotel, there's an accommodations tax or a hotel motel tax. 
And when you collect these taxes, that money in turn goes to the city, and the city in turn will use that money to promote the community to bring more people in. And then also too, if you have SWAS projects going in, you know, SWAS money isn't all collected by just the locals, you know, and so when these folks come in, that penny tax is going directly back into your community. And so anyway, I want you to understand um, one of the takeaways is that sports tourism is economic development and why that matters to a community. Um, the other thing is that, you know, what we do, it adds to the quality of life, you know, for a community. So like in the case with North Augusta, we have the Riverview Activity Center and Riverview Park. Um, we have disc golf course out there, we have the greenway that runs through North Augusta, basketball courts, and uh, we have these amazing facilities. And those amazing facilities during the week, during the spring, the summer, the winter, and the fall are being utilized by the locals. And uh, so that's for your local recreation leagues, your adult leagues, your church leagues, whatever it is. You know, this, you know, this is a quality of life thing that the community wants, demands, expects, and wants to utilize. The other part of that is that these same facilities are also economic drivers, you know, because on the weekends, a lot of times we host AAU basketball tournaments, we host Dixie Youth League baseball tournaments, um, wrestling tournaments, we host all of these special events. And so these events, we shut down our facility for a few days, we let these folks come in, we let them utilize the facility, they in turn are staying in our hotels. And so it's important. Um, so for a quality of life standpoint and an economic development standpoint, and then the last thing I want to say is that I firmly believe that you can do anything you want in Augusta, Georgia. If you have a plan that is good, you can get support. When I moved to Augusta, Georgia, I'm from Atlanta, um, and I had moved to Vermont. I was, I was trying to become a professional bike racer. And somewhere along the back roads of around Killington, Vermont, I discovered that abject poverty and chronic tendonitis were no way to get through life. <laughs> I couldn't deal with it anymore and you know I knew that I wasn't going to turn pro and it was a futile but you know fun attempt you know but whatever um, but I moved to Augusta and um, because my parents were here and if any of y'all remember a restaurant called Le Café du Toe or The Plum mm -hmm. those are my brothers they're not my uncles they're not my grandparents they're not you know my distant cousins those are my brothers Don and Gary du Toe and um, so I didn't know what I was going to do when I retired. So I moved back to Augusta because my parents had lived here. They said you could work with the restaurant and kind of figure out what you were going to do. I thought maybe I'd be here for a year. Um, I've been here for 30 with a little bit of a break um, when I moved back to Atlanta for a short while. But um, I launched the bike race in 1992 and that bike race, um, 30 years later um, was a direct, has directly resulted in events like the Augusta Half Ironman, all the USA Cycling National Championships, the Augusta Half Marathon. <coughs> all of these, these events um, really started out of one small little bike race out of Fort Gordon. And I'm not saying that to you know, pat myself on the back, but I'm saying that you know, enough people in this community believed in the idea, believed in what it could do, that they supported it. And, you know, a lot of these folks that live in this community, your Ed Fresnels, your Rick Tools, your Brad Ushries, your Charles Devaney's, you know, all of those people, they rallied around me, you know, and, and to say like, you know, we believe in what you're going to do. And, and it mattered, you know, because there were times when we tried to shut down the roads for events and the merchants like literally came after me. You know, they were so angry that I was going to kill their business you know, that they just came after me in the media and like wrote nasty things about me. But, you know, these people that were city leaders, you know, and a lot of them who are still community leaders, you know, they backed me up. You know, they said, you know, these things that you're doing are the future of, of Augusta. And so we're going to support you. And so that's the other thing is that you can do anything you want in Augusta. As long as you have a good plan, you know, and you think it through, people will support what you want to do. So um, getting back to the theme of this event, you know, it's about turning points. And I remember looking at the description and it was talking about, you know, it's something that, you know, maybe in one moment, you know, becomes this big breakthrough or it's something that sort of gets nurtured over time. And so I think that it's sort of fitting in, in what, you know, I was able to do and what I was able to do through other people or with other people too. Um, because when I started the bike race in 1992, 
it was it was a small event. We had 98 total participants. We had it out at Fort Gordon, and it was on September 27, 1992, um, that we had this event. And shortly thereafter, um, Jean Daniels. Does anyone here know Jean Daniel, who used to work with the banks? Um, you know, she came to me at the restaurant and she said, um, "Would you be interested in taking your bike race?" and tagging it into our Augusta Invitational Rowing Regatta Sports Festival that we're creating. It was called Regatta Fest. And so we literally had six months to pull together a full weekend of bike racing. And um, so around the time that she said, you need to do this event, she said, there's a brand new organization called the Greater Augusta Sports Council. And you need to go to them and write a proposal and tell them that you wanna put on a bike race and tell them why you wanna do it and they will provide a grant for you and they will help you get this project rolling. I said, okay, great. And I didn't know why the Augusta Sports Council would wanna support a bike race. I figured, okay, maybe they think it's just a cool thing for the, the community. I had no idea why they would be interested in supporting this event. Um, but I wrote a bid and I said, if we do this event and you support it, then we're gonna to try to bring the Olympic trials to Augusta. And they were like, okay, that's great. <laughs> so they said, we're going we're gonna to try to make this happen. Had no idea how to make an Olympic trials happen. I didn't, you know. Um, and so one afternoon, and, and I was reluctant to even mention this, but, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny story, or maybe it's sort of sad, but it, it ended up paying off. But, you know, on Mondays, the cafe was closed, and so I was off that afternoon. And so I went out to lunch with some buddies, and we had a couple of beers, and, you know, came back home, and, thought, you know, I've got to figure out how to make a bike race, you know, bigger. <laughs> and so I looked in the, uh, on the USA Cycling website, or I looked on their magazine, and, and I got the director's, um, the associate director's phone number, and I called. And I said, we have an amazing venue out at Fort Gordon. This is a circuit that we could completely close, and we want to host the Olympic trials. You know, will you do this? And she said, I'm listening. And I said, okay, this is cool, you know? And so um, we got their attention and then I called Charlie Abranowitz, who was the director at the time. And I said, Charlie, um, I've got USA Cycling's interest in bringing the Olympic trials here. So what do we do now? And he was like, you know, we'll take care of this. And so in 1993, um, when we had that first Augusta Cycling Weekend, we had the associate director, the public relations director and the operations director for USA Cycling here to not only look at Augusta as a potential venue, um, for an Olympic trials event, but it also kickstarted a, a discussion about potentially bringing the Olympics to Augusta. And so there, um, for a short while, we were discussing putting the, um, the Olympic velodrome out at Fort Gordon, um, talking about potentially having the, uh, the road race out at Fort Gordon. Unfortunately, none of that happened, but we did get the 1994 Masters National Cycling Championships. And this four day event brought in over 800 riders and about 250 extra staff and um, we hosted this event. And I remember after the event talking to Stam Tammy Stout, who was the director at the time of the Sports Council, and she said, did you know that this event generated 2,000 room nights and had an economic impact of blah, blah, blah? And I just remember looking at her going, why do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she goes, because that's our job. And I was like, really, what do you mean? And she said, yes, when we support these events, we support them because we know they're going to put people in our hotels and our restaurants and our stores. And so that's why that mattered. And I said, it wasn't just because it was a cool event. And she said, you know, it's, it's nice that it's a cool event, but it's really more important that it generates room nights. And so um, they bought in and, you know, soon we were off to the races with these big events. And so through 1997, we were a part of the national racing calendar, and um, every year we would have a big event that would bring in around 600 athletes, you know, for a long weekend. The economic impact would be significant, and then they would go on about their business. Now, at the time, I was not a professional sports guy. I wasn't even a professional cycling guy. I didn't know how to do events, but I was sort of learning on the fly. And um, I did these events, but I figured, you know, at some point, I do need to start getting realistic about life. And so um, my girlfriend, now wife, and I moved to Atlanta for a short while. And while I was in Atlanta, I was able to uh, pull up, um, start doing some contracts because I actually developed a good amount of experience doing events. And so I was working at events like the Steeplechase and you know other things. And um, 
you know, basically learning my craft. And also, you know, when I had gotten dedicated myself to professional bike racing, I um, quit college. And so I didn't have a college degree. And so um, my wife was looking at grad school and she was looking at Georgia State where I had already been going. You know, we were in Atlanta. And she said, I found this program in sports and recreation management. And, you know, you might want to consider doing that and then, you know, continue doing what you're doing. And so as soon as I graduated, I literally went from being an intern who had worked at the Olympic, or I, I literally went from getting my degree and uh, taking an internship where I was making eight bucks an hour. Um, but, you know, all the while having worked at the Olympics, I worked at the Paralympics in 96. I, you know, developed all these cycling events and I'm, I'm working as an intern for Fulton County. And um, one day the, uh, the director for Fulton County Parks and Recreation took me down to the job board. I said, my internship's gonna be wrapping up soon and um, I, need to, I need to find a job. And he took me down and said, look, the Olympic Shooting Complex is, is, um, has an opening and we own that facility. And I said, I know nothing about shooting. I've been in one shooting range in my life. And he said, yeah, but you could turn it into a multi-use facility. It was a 400 acre facility with about 300,000 square feet of building space. And so I started working at the Olympic Shooting Complex. I literally went from being a, an intern to being the director of a 400 acre complex. And it was pretty cool. So um, the reason I'm sharing that with you is the experience that I was able to gather while I was in Atlanta um, proved to be like really beneficial for me mm -hmm. because we moved back to Augusta in 2004 and in 2005 I started working for the Augusta Sports Council. And um, when I was hired for the Augusta Sports Council, Clint Bryant was the chair at the time and like immediately I was able to bring in some big cycling events and I remember Clint's listening to my report and I was talking about these various events that we had going or that we were working on and he said Randy that's a lot of cycling events and I turned to him and I apologized and I said I didn't mean for it to be like that and he said it's why we hired you you know it's why we hired you he goes he goes that can't be your sole purpose but it's why we hired you and so in that time you know we brought in a ton of really cool events now let me get back to my notes and then also while we're here, does anybody have any questions or any thoughts? Because I really do kind of like discussion when I chat. So, um, it just, it's, it just seems that uh, North Augusta doesn't communicate to Augusta like what you're doing. And a lot of times events occur that we're not even aware of. Um, maybe, you know, but maybe that's why I was hired, you know, I mean, like literally when I started with North Augusta and I'll get into this in a few minutes, but like when I was hired by North Augusta, you know, they had somebody who more or less worked in a tourism capacity because like our department is North Augusta parks, recreation and tourism, you know, but they didn't really have anybody with experience that, you know, could drive that process. And so literally for the last year and a half, I've been building up a ground up program. You know, and so it involves building a website, it develops, you know, like working on media contacts, it's working on all of that. And so, you know, if, if you don't know about what's going on in Augusta, you know, then maybe we can do a better job at marketing it. But I think also too, it's just, it's just a sort of a situational awareness because, you know, well, if you're not thinking, let's go find something in North Augusta, then you're not going to find it. Well, it, prior to COVID, you know, we had the Metro Spirit and the Chronicle would list all the activities that were going on around the area. But now we don't have sort of a central place to get that information. And so, you know, I would love for North Augusta to be a little more, I don't know, get on our airwaves or something, you know, to let us know. Because I know a lot of times North Augusta has wonderful events that, you know, occur, but I'm not aware of them until they're actually going on, you know, so I can't plan it. And that, you know, and that does present a challenge, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing about, you know, I think the times today, mm -hmm. because we have more media outlets than we can handle. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens good. with all of these media outlets is that, you know, you, you kind of fine tune and find focus on what it is you're looking for. And all of a sudden, you know, you sort of miss out on everything else. Yeah, that's the problem. Now we have to go to each site to find out what's going on. Whereas before, when we had the Metro Spirit, you know, it would all be there. So right. you could, you know, find out about it. 
Yeah. It's okay, I live in North Augusta and I don't know what's going on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, it's a challenge, yeah. you know, but like if you want to know what's going on in Augusta, you could visit North Augusta um, SC on Facebook, um, North Augusta PRT on Facebook. You know, we have our social um, platforms. We also have visitnorthaugustasc.com, which is our website. And so, again, it's it, it kind of hits to your point that you have to, to excuse me, hyper focus on what it is we're doing. But um, it's a challenge that that not only I face, but a lot of folks face. You know, because you say you live in North Augusta, but you don't know. I mean, the, the world has become like everybody has technology. Well, guess what? Not everybody has technology. Yeah. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Wi-Fi. You know, so I, I'm out of the loop. Yeah. Except I do go over to friends' house, and I have a list of Columbia County Library. Great place. They have all kinds of things. Augusta History Museum. I go. I have to go to all, every <coughs> site to see what's going to happen. See, that's the month. problem. You have to go to every site. Right. Whereas before. You had all that information in one place, and so it's like there. I don't know. Check out my plan. Like even if you want to find out what's going on at the James Brett, you know, arena or anything, you have to go to each site, and it just is so time consuming. You know, like so you don't do it. Yeah. No, I get it, and you know, it's a challenge that we all face as marketers. You know, and so that's you know, it is what happens. So. Yeah. Um, but I want to kind of bring it back to to talk, you know, because it really is, you know, a lot of this was about you know, sports venues in the Augusta River region. And having worked with Columbia County for four years, the Augusta Sports Council for seven, and then also with North Augusta for a year and a half, I have a pretty great handle on what's going on in this area. And one of the things that I think that we've been really strong with is, is really utilizing the assets that we have. You know, when um, we started doing the bids for the national championships, we had Fort Gordon which you know is is a godsend when it comes to putting on a you know major cycling event because the venue is so huge you have support from the from the military at, uh, at you know with the army and then also you have this nice safe secure circuit you know and not many people have that but there was a great utilization with utilization with fort gordon and maximizing that partnership with those guys that really helped us out tremendously you know then moving on to like with the augusta sports council you know, um, I don't know that many people even know this story, but when we launched the Augusta Half Marathon, that really became the genesis of the Augusta Half Ironman. We had brought in a gentleman by the name of Bill Burke with Premier Event Management to discuss launching a half marathon. And um, he flew in late one evening, we were gonna meet him at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, at the Marriott the next day to, uh, to have our meeting to discuss how we could launch this event. And when he woke up in the morning, he walked down the back and saw the river walk. And he was like, I didn't realize you guys had a river, you know, and you're right on it. And so then he went on Google Earth and he's like, where does the river lead and, and what can we do? And so he we sat down for breakfast and he literally said, I know you want to talk about a half marathon. We'll get to that. Have you ever thought about hosting a half Ironman? And we were like, no. And, uh, but should we? And, um, and we did and um, right out of the gate, it was amazing. But it was, a, it was a cool thing because like, we didn't use a sports venue to do this event. We used the Savannah River. We used the roads in, in Augusta, Richmond County and Aiken County. And then we used the, uh, the half marathon course in downtown Augusta. And it was really interesting because when we, when we booked this event, you know, the reaction was, why Augusta? You know, I mean, I literally had friends who called me from Atlanta and they said, you know, so are you going to call your, your, your event Tour Disgusta? And, and it made me mad, you know, because it's like, it's not fair, you know, that you, 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 there was a reason why somebody saw that we were good enough to host this event. And when we hosted the event, we knew that it had to be organized within an inch of its life. You know, otherwise we were going to get hammered for it. And um, when we launched the event, when we launched registration, our goal was 1,500 athletes. And I remember three weeks into registration, Bill Burke called me and he said, Randy, we're at 1,400 right now. He goes, I'm gonna bump it to 2,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we do that? Yeah, we can do 2,000. And you know, a month later, we're at 1,900. We're gonna go to 2,500. That first year we had 3,300 athletes <laughs> and it was the largest Ironman branded event period in the world and it was organized so well. And it was interesting because when I was reading all of the reviews for the event on various forums, 
you know, a lot of folks were like, the event was great, the volunteers were amazing, the police and law enforcement support was, was tremendous, everything was great about it, but downtown looks terrible. You know, we got hammered, you know, I think that people expected that they were going to run through the Augusta National. And, you know, <laughs> sorry, we asked, but it can't happen, you know, sorry. But um, I saw one review that, um, that really stood out to me. It was a woman who had participated and she said, yeah, I saw the same volunteers. I saw the same medical support that, that they had. And I was completely impressed with how they did that event. And she said, I also saw a community that was trying to repurpose itself as a sports community. I saw a community that had um, seen its downtown die because of the, uh, the suburban shopping malls. You know, when those things started popping up and all of a sudden everybody left downtown. So she's like, yeah, I saw the, the boarded up um, windows and I saw the closed storefronts, but she saw, I saw a community that was trying to redo its downtown, you know, through this sports event. And she completely got it. And I remember after the event, we had gone to all these restaurants, well, I say all these restaurants because there weren't nearly that many downtown as there are now. But I remember um, going to these restaurants saying, can you guys please open on Sunday? We've got this event going on and there are gonna be a ton of people here. Can you please, no, we don't open on Sunday. <laughs> and Blue Sky Kitchen, you know, who unfortunately are not here anymore, but uh, they opened. And I remember reading, seeing an interview with the, uh, the manager on Monday after Iron Man. She's like, we set a record, period. We didn't set a Sunday record, we didn't set a weekend record. We set a sales record, period, that we don't know will be until next year. You know, and you know, next year, every single restaurant in downtown, I guess, was open. Money talks, man, money talks. So, um, but yeah, so like we, we launched this event and um, so kind of getting back to like the, the whole sports venue thing, we literally were able to turn the streets of, of North or Augusta into a, a marathon or a half marathon venue and into Augusta half Ironman venue and also to a national cycling championship venue. You know, um, moving on when I went to Columbia County, you know, Columbia County, if you've not spent much time out there, has amazing natural assets. You have the lake where we did massive fishing tournaments, um, some of the biggest fishing tournaments in the country. Um, for several years, we hosted the Marathon Mountain Bike National Championships. And when I started working for Columbia County, I contacted USA Cycling and I said, do you guys have anything open for bid? And they said, we have Marathon Mountain Bike Nationals. It's a one day event. It's a standalone event that will maybe bring in 300 athletes. So it's not gonna be the five day, 1200 athlete event that you're used to. But he said, maybe you can build this into something. And so since we had the infrastructure in place, the timing teams, everything in place, we decided to create a sports festival. And so um, we created the Wildwood Games. And so with the Wildwood Games, we had the Marathon Mountain Bike National Championships. We had four distances of trail running events. We had an open water swim, and we had a disc golf tournament, all utilizing assets that are within um, Wildwood Park. And it was tremendous. And um, my take on that event, even though it didn't have the economic impact of doing some bigger road cycling championships like we had done in Augusta, um, the reason why I did that is because nobody knew about the trails in Columbia County. We have three different trail systems in Columbia County. At Mistletoe State Park, we have Bartram Trail and then Keg Creek Trail. And nobody really knew about those trails. Everybody knew about the Forks Trails or the Fast Trails, um, Mountain Edgefield County or McCormick County, whatever county you want to consider. But um, nobody knew about the trails that we had. And so we had an opportunity to bring the top mountain bikers in the country to our trails. And so when you bring those mountain bikers in, you know, they're posting on their social media, they're posting on Twitter, they're, you know, they're getting the message out that like, hey, you know, this place is really great. And we were able to draw attention to what we were doing. And one thing that makes me particularly proud about that is so, you know, even though I left Columbia County almost 10 years ago, you know, that is still a big component of what um, their tourism team is pushing. You know, they just recently, like last weekend during National Trails Day, promoted now the Bond Basin Trail. And then prior to that, they did the Serene 18 Trail, which is a water trail for canoeing and kayaking. And so one of the things that we're doing with, with these sports events is it's not just about like the athletic leagues, although that is super important. You know, to us, if you've got a venue that can be used as a sports event, great. But then at the same time, like with our thinking with the mountain bike races out in Columbia County, is that these folks are gonna come out, they're gonna race on our, our trails for a weekend, 
and then they're going to get home. But then when they're thinking about a place to go spend a weekend, well, they're going to come and see us, you know, because, you know, maybe they want to come out and spend a weekend when they're not, you know, like their eyes are bleeding and their lungs are burning and, you know, they're barely staying alive because they're racing bikes, you know. And so it just presents a great opportunity for us to show off the assets that we have. So now, you know, kind of moving on from Columbia County to uh, North Augusta, where I've been for the last year and a half, you're probably familiar with the Nike Peace Jam. Um, this is the Nike um, Excellence in Youth Basketball League, and uh, they have a series of tournaments around the country, and it all culminates in North Augusta at the uh, Riverview Park um, Activity Center. And this event annually generates around $19 million um, to the local economy. And when I say the local economy, I truly mean the, the local regional economy. You know, because there's no way um, that we could store everyone or house everyone in North Augusta. So the Augusta hotels get hit pretty hard and then also the Columbia County hotels as well. Um, one thing that, that really came out of the early days of the Nike Peach Jam were all of these ancillary basketball tournaments, you know, because all of a sudden, you know, these other AAU basketball promoters realized that they had an opportunity with Nike because Nike was bringing in all of the coaches, a lot of the pros were coming in and all these major teams were here. Um, so all these other tournaments started happening and then Nike, I think, kind of took over a lot of these tournaments. And so um, we have like a really firm, I guess, handle, you know, on all of the other events that are going on. And so we, we, North Augusta, can truly lay claim to this economic impact. You know, it's our guy Jeremy Junies, who is the, uh, the, the main supervisor out at Riverview Park, who is really a lot of the reason why the Nike Peach Jam is here. You know, it's through his organization with the venues throughout Augusta, um, you know, and Columbia County as well, that um, we're able to host these events and, you know, Nike keeps coming back. And so these things are really significant. Now with me in North Augusta, um, you know, we're gonna start looking into doing other events, like some more of the lifestyle type events. And that's what I consider running and cycling and those things. And so last year when we launched down to the river or rocking and rafting, you know, the intent was to really promote the river, you know, as an asset because we really weren't doing anything on the river. And so we did this, this nice event, you know, and it drew some attention. It was neat, you know, but like this year um, with the rebranding, um, you know, we added running events, we added a cycling event, you know, for the Greenway and we continued with the paddling races and we'll continue to expand that program. And, um, to me, it's great because when we do these types of events, we're not really gumming up the park or the activity center, you know, but we are promoting our assets. And um, does anybody have any questions right now? And then, yes, ma'am. Um, have things settled down as far as rowing regattas on the river? Um, I think so. You know, it's, it's kind of an interesting period right now with the regatta. Um, well, A, because like for the longest time, the Augusta Invitational, which was held in March, um, is now over at um, Langley Pond. And what they're doing over at Langley is amazing. You know, like they've done some really great things, but that was one big event that was was taken out to Langley Pond. And now with the challenges that the Augusta Rowing Club is facing, you know, with the boathouse. And um, to me, I think that if this gets dropped, you know, we're blowing an amazing opportunity. You know, because for years, like when I first moved here, I had no idea that rowing had such a big impact in this area. And it just, blew me away like going through downtown Augusta, or downtown Augusta during the springtime and seeing like a group of 40 kids with their college schools on their jackets you know and you don't see that as much now and um, you know and if the boathouse goes away where are we you know I wish that I could write a check and build a boathouse in North Augusta you know because I would do it in a heartbeat because we would take over it you know but um, and I know I think I'm kind of going long and I don't want to do that, but, um, you know, one of the things that I've done as a sports consultant is really try to maximize, like when I go into a community, you know, I want to know what their sports facilities are, but I also want to see what their other assets are, because my take on it is that if you have a big concrete pad, you could have a four square tournament. So there you go. You have sports tourism. So I always try to get the communities to understand the assets that they already have. Whereas a lot of consultants will come in and say, you know what, if you build, you know, eight basketball courts in this activity center and then have 53 baseball fields, you know, you're going to be able to do sports tourism. And we always say, make sure that the facilities that you already have are being utilized, 
you know, before you start building bigger facilities. You know, don't, don't chase something that may or may not be there. You know, utilize what you have. And then if you see that you're gonna expand beyond those means, take advantage of it. And so that's kind of like a lesson that, you know, I learned through the years, you know, and so that's why I think I excelled with endurance events is because, you know, I knew how to use those assets. But, you know, fortunately through my time with the Augusta Sports Council and working with Columbia County, we also started working within the traditional sports realm as, as well. Um, I hope that I'm sharing some good information. I probably need to wrap it up because it is One late. More yes, sir. Uh, get back to the theme of turning points. Yes. I assume that the turning point is 1992. It is. It is. Well, okay. thank you for bringing me back because <laughs> it really is, you know, because at the time, you know, the community supported what I was doing okay. and I had no idea, you know, why, you know, like it wasn't because my brothers owned Cap 82, you know, <laughs> but, um, they, they believed in it and, um, they continued to support it through the years. And all of these years later, I mean, cycling events like the Ironman alone has contributed probably around $40 million to the Augusta economy. You know, the cycling events themselves have generated over $10 million for the local economy. And we didn't know going into this that this was where it was going to lead. And I didn't go into it thinking this was going to be my career. You know, but um, that was the turning point. It really was. And um, I'm glad that you brought that back for me. Um, but, you know, when I was looking at that, at the description last night about, you know, what is the turning point? And I was like, okay, that is the thing. You know, because we didn't know when we started this project, you know, that it was going to turn into something so big. You know, but I recall, you know, one year seeing on um, the medical college's um, recruitment page, and they were talking about the cycling events that we were hosting. They were talking about the local trails, and that mattered. I remember sitting in a presentation at Sioux Park, what the Augusta Chamber was doing, talking about how they wanted to, you know, do road calming diets and do things that were favorable to downtown in order to support events. And, you know, these things that really could be seen as a nuisance to people that don't care, you know, because you're inconvenienced because you can't get on a road for a short while. You know, other folks said, let's do this you know, and let's support it. And, and they're still supporting it to this day. And I think it's why I've been given a free run in North Augusta to create and to do. It's why I was given a free run in Columbia County as well. You know, it's just, you know, if you've got a plan and you can garner support, you can make some amazing things happen. And um, anyway, I hope that, you know, my stories have been good. Yes, ma'am. Would you have been able to do all of this without the footprint that the masters had already laid here with the hotels, the restaurants? I mean, you might have had the facility to have the event, but you also need the hotels and the restaurants for them to stay and eat. Yes, but yeah, there's, and I, and I say that with a but, you know, because you guess yeah. the, the masters is an anomaly. You know, I mean, like everybody, you know, it's like, it's the Indy 500, it's the, it's the Kentucky Derby, you know, so that we have that. And, you know, the infrastructure that is developed to support the masters certainly benefits us, but there's also been an educational process that we've had to go through, whether it be through the Augusta Sports Council or through Columbia County or North Augusta to say, listen, folks, you know, these things matter, you know, because um, like I had a situation with Tour de Georgia where um, I, I, we had contracts in place, and um, I'll make this the last story and I'll shut up, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Don't roll your eyes, okay? But um, <laughs> when the last tour to Georgia happened in 2008, we had won a bid to be a, a, a overall finish stage. And, um, but the problem is that every year, tour to Georgia struggled um, with money, with financing for the event. And so in 2008, they literally did not know they were going to have a 2008 event in April until January. And by the time January happened, um, we had lost the Marriott and we needed the Marriott to house an entourage of around 600 people. And so we ended up having to put them in two other hotels that had a, a little community center in between them so that we could do team meals and whatnot. And we had contracts in place. Two days before the event, um, the operations director for Tour de Georgia called and said, listen, you know, they're, they're not going to honor their contract. You know, they're not going to honor their contract. They're not going to do all the things that they said they would do for us and for our teams. So what do we do? 
So I called the hotel general manager and I said, listen, we have a contract. And she said to me, and I quote, um, all of this hassle ain't worth one night's worth of business. Mm -hmm. And I said, ma'am, I booked 30,000 hotel rooms a year. So if you think this is about one night's worth of business, you're sadly mistaken. I strongly suggest that you rethink your position and call me when you want to talk to me like an adult. And, and I said that. <laughs> and, and listen, I am the most passive, like easygoing individual on the planet. But like when you haven't slept in three weeks, <laughs> you're really stressed out because you have this massive event coming in town and you know somebody irritated you with something that was just completely erroneous. I, I had to push back and you know they called back 30 minutes later and said we'll honor everything that we're doing you know but I never went back to their hotels and I left the Augusta Sports Council in 2012 so um, but anyway you know thank y'all I appreciate it I, I hope you get it